Hey folks, Matt from ArtOfTheImage.com. Today I got for you four tips for great landscape photography. Those of you that are into taking landscapes, and there's a lot of people out there, I like to go out and do it myself sometimes. Um, there's a lot of ways to improve your landscape photos, and I've got four big ones for you right here. So, what do we got? We got timing, probably the biggest one, I would say, or at least one of the biggest ones, and that is the timing of when you take your photo. And um, if you're lazy and don't want to get up in the morning, then you can do it in the evening. So there's a hint right there on what we're looking at. Sunrise and sunset. These are your two best times to take landscape photography, uh, landscape photos. The colors are more pleasing. Your lighting is more pleasing. You got more subtle colors. You got less contrast from hot sun. And um, you'll find that this alone will increase your uh, landscape photos, the quality of them, by a huge amount if you start paying attention to and timing your photos for sunrise or sunset. Do a little experiment. Go look through um, landscape photos and find your favorites. Look ones that are the most appealing to you and whatnot. And I almost guarantee you that those photos were taken somewhere around sunrise or sunset. And uh, yeah, sunrise, you got to get up early, although that can be... Um, very rewarding in and of itself and oftentimes um, is a time when you can get photos without being disturbed because nobody else is around sunset works too but you might run into uh, people encroaching or people in um, you know in your photos around your photos that weren't there if you had been out in the morning so those are uh, two times sunrise and sunset and uh, those are the best for timing for landscape photos number two composition uh, some of you have heard this before, some of you haven't. If you have, you might not have taken it to heart, but really, you should study this. It's something every photographer should know for everything, and that's rule of thirds for composition. Not saying you always have to follow it, but you should know it, so when you do break it, you know what you're doing. Rule of thirds basically means you divide your photo up into thirds, and you can go that um, both horizontally and vertically. Am I doing that right? Anyways, uh, break your photo up into thirds in your head when you're, when you're seeing what you're shooting at there. And then um, put your main uh, points of your photo on one of those lines of thirds. Um, so decide where your horizon should be, which line do you want it on. You can structure out your photo that way. And um, the rule of thirds is, uh, is uh, an old, old concept. It goes way back thousands of years into the Greeks or the Romans. I forget actually who came up with it. But um, a, a very uh, it works psychologically in your head in the sense of... Um, it often you can often figure out when you look at a photo why it's pleasing um, when you start analyzing it by rule of thirds or conversely you look at a photo and you don't like it and you'll realize it's because it's been positioned poorly it's been set up poorly and it violates rule of thirds uh, in ways that are not pleasing you can violate rule of thirds you just have to make sure it's pleasing so rule of thirds and composition folks be aware of that number three number three depth of field Depth of field basically means, for those of you who don't know, uh, is what's in focus at a given aperture. So every lens has its characteristics, and at a certain aperture, it'll have a certain amount in focus. So the uh, what will be in focus from uh, the foreground to the background uh, for that given aperture. Now, um, there's uh, depth of field charts you can get for just about every lens out there, and there's calculators for this too online, so you can check all those out. Um, I'll see if I can find a, um, an online calculator for you and post a link, although if you Google that, um, the old let me Google that for you uh, acronym, um, you'll find them. And uh, basically, I mean, the rule of thumb here is that the, um, the, the smaller numbers, like 1.8, which is your wider aperture, uh, less in focus. Your depth of field is much shallower. In other words, um, you could conceivably, you know, at some of these smaller depth of, or these wider de uh, apertures, smaller depth of fields, focus on somebody's eye and their nose could be out of focus. Whereas if you're up to f8, for instance, then uh, it's pretty hard to get somebody's eye in focus and their nose out of focus. Or on a landscape, same type of thing, uh, what's in focus and what isn't. Um, so, um, this is pertinent for any type of photography is knowing what your depth of field and using it. I'm not saying always make sure everything is in focus because you might not want that effect, but know what your depth of field is for that lens, for that given aperture you're using, and be aware of it and use it to your advantage. Uh, so, so know your depth of field settings, know what, what, um, 
the depth of field is at a given aperture on the lens you're using at the time. Be aware of it and use it as a tool to create the photo you're trying to create. Okay, number four. Um, I don't think there's really much controversy about this anymore. Uh, shoot raw. Uh, there are times to shoot JPEG. I mean, we can have this argument back and forth, but basically, um, shoot raw. Memory is so cheap now. Uh, size isn't a consideration really anymore. Um, most of our current computers can handle a raw file from any of the DSLRs anyways that we're shooting with, any of the of the of the cameras that you're likely to be shooting with. I mean, sure, if you're using a medium format back or something even larger, you might not have the processing power, but that doesn't that doesn't really apply to most of us, if not the largest percent of us. So why would we want to shoot raw? Um, maximum file quality uh, and hence maximum ability to post process. Um, actually, not even always maximum file quality because some people will argue that a JPEG has very good, very good uh, file quality too. Although there's a whole argument there. I mean, uh, uh, you could look at it basically as the raw is your negative, the JPEG is your cooked photo after the fact, um, you know, like a print. Um, there's much more latitude for making adjustments and post editing in a raw file than there is in a JPEG and that's undisputable. Um, especially if you want to, if you're somebody that likes to work on your files a lot, you should be shooting in raw. Um, if you're doing landscape shots and you want to play with uh, the lighting in certain areas, you want to bring the lighting down in your sky, you want to do, you know, all these sorts of things that can be done very nicely in raw in a post editor like Lightroom or in Photoshop or whatever you're using, shoot raw, folks. It's, it's a no brainer. It's going to give you the ability. Uh, to work on your files better and to get the maximum quality out of that image you took the time to create. So um, those are your four. Uh, four big tips on how to get better um, landscape photos, how to do better landscape photography. Uh, let me know what you think, folks. Did I miss a big one? Did I leave something out? Do you disagree with something? Uh, feel free. Post your comments below. Keep it civil. We'll be back soon here at artoftheimage.com. Thanks, folks.